الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أتي الله أتي الرسول أول الأمر منكم and always a reminder from myself and abdukul ajeez and da'eef of miskeen of zalim and jahan but for the grace of Allah that we are still in existence. Alhamdulillah that Allah give us a life in which to see this year's hajj and to enter into the holy month of Zul Hijjah and the time of hajj. Alhamdulillah that we talked about the tawaf and the tawaf is a reminder of our focus in life and that the inner hajj is the goal towards the oceans of reality and the love of Sayyidina Muhammad Our safa and marwa is a lifelong process of the Divine springs and oceans of reality that Allah want to dress within the soul of the seekers. Because everything that we are doing physically is a much deeper reality spiritually. That which we're focusing on, we're making our tawaf and our focus is Allah making our seven tawaf because we have seven names in Divine the Presence and asking that each tawaf that we're making dressing our reality upon this earth and that each of the seven realities dressing us upon this earth to reach towards Allah's Divinely pleasure and Divinely lights. The Safa and Marwa is our oceans and springs of reality that online we have a much more de detailed understanding of the springs and it's a lifelong journey that a continuous struggle as we struggle in our way and, and to reach our, our way of realities Allah is dressing the soul of the believers and those whom He has inspired to reach to the higher heights and to the higher realities. So everything is about the reaching of the inward. We talked the other night, trying to find our article on Naqshbandiya and built upon the eleven principles of Naqshbandiya. Tariqah, so every, every tariqah had a specialty and a, a gift that they were bringing out. Mevlevi's and Sayyidina Jalaluddin Rumi Siru was bringing out the reality of the Muhammadan haqqaiq and teaching the students sama. That was the physical manifestation of teaching them that your whole focus is on the heart, that make your body to run after the heart, that the wuqufu qalb and the vigilance of your heart and then this ishq and love of the Muhammadan reality. The love poetry was not about people, what he was giving of, of inspirations and ilham coming through his heart was when you are non-existent the love that you are experiencing is the love that Allah has for the reality of Sayyidina Muhammad and the immense unimaginable love that Sayyidina Muhammad has for Divine the Presence. When the, the self is out what is being felt is the love of the Divinely Presence. As a result of all of those writings of ishq and love it's not from the seeker because the seeker is negated and the seeker is, is merely negating themselves to be nothing. In the ocean of nothingness is to witness the One and to witness what Allah wants the servant to witness. From that witnessing immense oceans of love poetry and love for the Divine the Presence, love of what Allah what we try to describe as this love that Allah has for Sayyidina Muhammad 
because he created this creation out of love, this haqqaiq is the ocean of love and as a result he beautifies everything for the sake of that love. And that's why the immensity of those poetries, that's why the immensity of teaching the students about that love that if they lost themselves and they entered into that love their sama they would rise and they were levitating off the ground in their sama which no longer is happening. And a lot of these miracles stop because the time is too close for the dajjal and they don't want to mix events that are happening with dajjal. Then the rifai and, and qadri theirs was the standing reality of ishq and love that they stand for the hadra and the presence of Sayyidina Muhammad and that to take from that Divinely Qudra a fires into their heart. That every time they stood and they resembled the atomic reality that they are the electrons and Prophet is the nucleus and the nucleus is only positive and emitting positive. And the sultanate of that positive that he sends out the lightning from his heart and as a result it hits everyone on the circumference and as a result of that hit it brings the electron closer into the Divinely Presence. So this, the reality of their hadra was hadra the Nabi Naqshbandiyat al-Aliyah were the immense oceans of esoteric knowledge that because of the mastery of the foundation they laid for entering into their heart. That their miracle was to teach the student how to clean, how to wash, how to sit and enter into the heart. And because of the depth of their muraqaba, their tafakkur, all their contemplation was then the immense realities of knowledges that were coming out from Naqshbandiya. And this was the, the fame of Naqshbandiya was the uloom and the knowledges but that was a result because of the specialties of tafakkur and contemplation which now became a, a time of jahaliyyah in which it's not even understood anymore. And People asking, is this even in tariqah to meditate, to make tafakkur, to make contemplation? So, we'll go over just one because as they, they become more, they're much more complicated. But from the principles that Mawlana Abdul Khaliq al Khushduwani and Mawlana Shah Naqshaban compiled, and they are about 400 years in difference. Mawlana Abdul Khaliq al Khushduwani was the was earlier the 11th shaykh, 17th shaykh of Naqshbandiya is Mawlana Shah Naqshban of the So be, the, the time doesn't matter for them in the realities of completing and their connection with each other but it's encapsulated by the name of Naqshbandiya because of the immensity of what Mawlana Shah Naqshband had put together for the school as if to finish it and seal it that from this point on the name doesn't change and Naqshbandiya then became the immense schools of haqqaiqs into the heart and how to tafakkur and contemplate into the depth of the heart. And that doesn't change until the presence of Sayyidina Mahdi salam which everything becomes Muhammadiyoon. That Sayyidina Mahdi salam doesn't follow anyone's name and all names will become Muhammadiyoon to follow the way of the Muhammadan representative and the reflection of Sayyidina Muhammad upon this earth. The first principle that they laid for us, for anyone who's coming to Naqshbandiya is Hush Dardam. Uh, hush is to be conscious, Dardam to be conscious of your breath. So that's why all of the shaykhs and Mawlana shaykh's book on the Naqshbandi golden chain has the lives of all the shaykhs and every single shaykh has a quote on the importance of the breath. So the tariqah is built on khushraddan, conscious breathing. 
And to encapsulate just the understanding of it is that the greatest gift that Allah has given to all of creation is the breath. And Mawlana Shaykh describes that Allah put from the secret of alif, lam, lam, hay, the secret of that hay is in every, every creation is the secret of that breath. So that nafas rahmah that is sending out to all of creation and everything is required to breathe whether upon the earth or under the sea it's breathing. It's breathing by the secret of that hay and with the reality of that hay we've described before that is who because that hay has a little wow above it and within it. It has a wow outside and has a wow hidden inside because it's all about the reality of who and ishq. So then this who is the secret of every breath. It's a power like the Wi-Fi we described that emanates everywhere. As a result of that power, that qudra, all creation is required to breathe it in. They consume that, that hay and as they consume it that who is giving them a life force. If the seeker doesn't understand that, what then is tariqah? Just get togethers and, and, and people walking around looking different than other people. So this was the, the usul of marifah, the Islamic usul these are for Islam. But for iman these principles of Naqshbandiya was for the school that the student wants to enter in, the first thing they have to be taught is the hushraddam, be conscious of your breath. All the teachings on the importance of breath, all the realities of who, that when you understand that this power of breath is who and the people that we call guides because they have hidayat, they, hey, they have wow and wudud. These guides of who, they're the guides of muhabbat and love. Everything about them should be loving. That's why if you looked at Mawlana Shaykh Nazim Sultan al-Awliya was immense ocean of who. Whether you were good or you were bad, he was always loving. Because his character is not based on you, is not based on the seeker, not based on anyone, is based on the Divinely reflection. His nazar, his vision and reflection is from Divinely presence, not based on people and creation. He merely reflects what Allah wants to be reflected upon humanity. But the reality of the who men is that they are the symbols of ishq and love, that they must be emanating a wow and that they have a love and compassion for everything. But doesn't mean all of them are, are, are not capable of errors because life and all of its complexities. But this is the basis of their training was to be filled with this Divinely ishq and love, a respect for all humanity, all creatures, all creation. And as a result Allah has sent them through the schools of tarbiyah and they were granted hidayat and guidance. And the hidayat and guidance is with all their faculties. They have to be have trained that their ears how to guide their ears means how to listen. When they accompanied their shaykh they listened. They didn't care if they were family with the shaykh, not family with the shaykh, don't interfere with what that reality of listening had to be. Because the shaykh was merely the symbol of Sayyidina Muhammad so that the hearing could be unlocked. But when you use your aql with them and don't hear from them, don't hear them, start using your own thought processes, this hearing doesn't open as was open for them. 
they opened their eyes because Allah taught them how to keep control of their eyes and that'll be in the other steps. As a result Allah showed them also how to clean their eyes. Once Allah stamped their eyes to be clean, taught them how to clean their eyes, they have been trained on how to keep their eyes clean. That for every event and everything that happening upon this earth, awliyaullah are witness to it. you good, the bad and extremely horrible, there must be angels present and awliyaullah present at every event. There's nothing happening on this earth that their soul is not witness to. From the torturing of people, killing, violence, whatever you can imagine of it, their soul must be present. If Allah didn't train them on how to clean, they would collapse from difficulty and horrific nature of the reality of dunya. But means that Allah trained their hidayah, trained their breath how to breathe, how to purify their breath. Hushtardam was then the importance of their breath, they understood that this power is in everything, it's reaching every creation to reach that who. As a result this is the most important force that Allah is sending onto this creation. So we call nafas al-Rahman is the breath of the merciful the most merciful. So then to train on how to connect with the shaykhs, how to connect with our reality and then in the tafakkur begin because everything its foundation is with the connection. So again the analogy is you first gonna build a house, then you're going to decide what you're putting into the house. If you don't it's as if you put your couch outside in the backyard, first is the house. Everything then beautiful goes inside the house. The house is the connection with the shaykh, otherwise if you begin to meditate without the shaykh of course shaitan is going to be sitting next to you and all his representatives are be going to be connecting to your head, to your ears and to your heart. That's why the connection has to come first, the tafakkur comes first. As soon as they connect, they learn to connect, they ask for the fires, they ask to be present, then hushtardam they begin to train that breathe, be conscious of this breath that coming in. Every breath that coming in is a power and energy and every dirtiness is being exhaled. This they trained with this, they trained with this breathing this energy until they catch the fire of that energy. When Allah again grant their breath and their training, sincerity, they begin to breathe like a Divine fire comes in and they begin to be ignited from that heat. Every dhikr they make when they say, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, everything in them is shaking and on fire because every dhikr has an immense power. We have emails from people, they say, Ya Jabbar and they begin to shake, Ya Qahar they begin to shake and said that the shaitan in the room was catching on fire as they were shaking, the shaitan was burning. Every dhikr of Allah with the breath of truth and the breath of, of cleanliness, the breath of reality is then ignited. Every dhikr, every salawat, every practice they're doing, they turning that into like a fire and that's why it becomes like a sun. Their realities are like suns, that they have a, a lit heart that everything they do, if they do it in their contemplative state, it begins to ignite and they don't do that all the time, it's going to cause problems for them and everything around them. But the reality of the breath was immense. So then we can see that if nobody's training on the breath and tafakkur and contemplation, what left of then tariqah? 
For the first step is that the breath has to be ignited, the energies have to be ignited, the heart has to be ignited so that when they are alone and they're doing their tafakkur, they're doing their contemplation, they made their connection and they begin their awrad, they begin their zikrs and oh, 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 they feel the energy of that. They feel the immense power the dressing their soul and their practices. We go to and then the immensity of all of that breath and the reality of the breath, the life of this breath and all the physiology of this breath, what happens when this power comes in and comes into the, to the lungs, comes into the heart, comes into all the organs, what type of power in the breath comes out in their breathing. So the immensity of that reality. Then the, the second of these principles is nazar bar qaddam and again these are all Farsi because Mawlana Shah Naqshaban they're all the Khurasan masters where all their futuhats are in Farsi. They say if Islam came in Arabic it became beautiful by Farsi, it brought out all the realities of Islam. So it means that for somebody to wonder, oh are these guys Shia, why are these guys Iranian? It's as if, as if they have lost all understanding of the reality of Islam. All of the realities of Islam and the beatific reality of Islam came from the people of Fars. Sayyidina Abdul Qadir Jailani was Farsi speaking that brought all these haqqaiqs and all these realities out. Tirmizi was Farsi speaking, Bukhari was Farsi speaking, all the hadith translations and, and books are all Farsi and all written in Farsi, all their maqams are in Uzbekistan which is all Khurasan which was all the lands of Fars. So again like in last days becomes something ajeeb and they want to give weird political titles. No, no these are from the, the Farsi masters bringing back all of this reality onto this earth for the presence of Sayyidina Mahdi Nazar bar qadam that they would then teach the students that your life is about where you're looking. That the nazar precedes the qadam, your, your eyes will precede where your movement will be. So that which you look at and focus at, don't be surprised your feet are following it later. So we know that the eyes and then the in-depth teaching, we have all of these on, on the website over these 20 years of teaching. This nazar is then the reality of your eyes. The reality of your eyes are your hawa, your, your dunya. What you want from dunya they say your eyes are hungry. So that which you look at with your physical eyes and, and don't compare with shaykh, these are for non-shaykh people. Shaykhs then they have a different system in which Allah has certified them with because of where they have to be and where their soul is always at. But the nazar of people on what they look at it's going to influence their qadam and their step and their movement. That which you look at, it's, it's, a, it's a food, you say the eyes are hungry, they're eating what they see and as a result it's pulling their body in that direction. And that's why we can understand that what shaitan is doing, he's pulling people. So there used to be a poetry for children, the Pied Piper where someone would play a pipe and gather all the children and take them out into the thing and drop them into the river. This was a British kids things, they have very scary kids things <laughs> but this was an example that, that that which they were focusing and making everybody to follow them in a tune and, and attract them to movement. Only Allah know that, that whatever your eyes are looking at is calling you. 
So you look towards all your dunya desires, all the things you want to buy, all the things that you want to look like. Shaitan knows that what you see through your eyes and he will pull you into that direction and then everybody goes and, and modifies themselves, modifies their bodies, go and buy everything that they can't afford and their qadam now is in a different direction. So then awliyaullah came and told Nazar bar Qadam that keep your life in which your nazar, your, your eyes that control your heart, control your, your dunya desires, keep them upon your feet, lower your gaze. Keep them upon your feet and the lowering of the gaze was that to focus on your qadam. Focus on your feet, this is all like a formula. So not just you lower your gaze looking at the sidewalk crack but the qadam and the secret of the qadam. The qadam is the path of Sayyidina Muhammad and say, qadam al-haqq because you can't take these teachings in half and that's why Prophet was teaching, Allah was teaching the believer, tell the believer to lower their gaze. Holy Allah come then to bring out its fruit and say, not only lower your gaze but keep your gaze upon your feet. And then they begin to say, why, why feet? Well because Qadam al-Haqq, the, uh, the feet and the path of truth is Sayyidina Muhammad so the reality of a qadam is that the meme, that it's a way towards the oceans of power of Sayyidina Muhammad Qadam as-Siddiq were the holy companions and Ahlul Bayt that they followed the way of Sayyidina Muhammad and as a result our life was from Atiullah, Atiyah Rasul wa ulul amri minkum. Why Allah warned for us? that follow them, obey them, keep their company because they are inheriting Qadam al-Haqq. They inherit Qadam al-Siddiq and their lives are to be muqaddam. So muqaddam, they are the people of the qadam, of the path. And so the nazar bal qadam means that keep your eye on your shaykh and on the teaching and on the path. Not only your own feet because if your feet are not going good and you're just dancing at a club looking at your feet, what it was the benefit of that? It wasn't just you know you take it halfway, the awliyaullah come to explain everything. That once you take a path in which to look where these feet are taking me, they're not taking me to Divinely Presence. So that the, the seeker would seek out that I want my feet to be muqaddam. I want to be somebody on a path towards the path of Sayyidina Muhammad So then I must follow a muqaddam, one whom is certified on that reality. And as a result I follow them, I follow their teaching, follow their way, follow all of the, the practices that they're giving to us so that I am a muqaddam, that I'm following this shaykh. And that my nazar means my heart and my desire is upon that path. Not only because you can meet people who, who look down and they could be of a very, very extreme ideology. They're not following what we're teaching, they just look down and imitate that they're pious. They may be looking down but in their heart may have very bad thoughts. They could be people praying intensely but have very bad thoughts. Very bad actions, they were praying the Daesh and these terrorists in Iraq, they were praying and then putting people in cages and burning them. But you say, my gosh they were praying and they had beautiful Arabic uh, recitation. So no it's not just that, it's when the… it's comments from these awliya that teach us when Allah wants you to look down, He wants you to recognize your feet and that your feet must be inheriting the feet of shaykhs. And those shaykhs must be inheriting from the holy companions and from Ahlul Bayt. And those Ahlul Bayt and companions they must be from the exemplars of the love of Sayyidina Muhammad 
And then we know in our life that we are nazar ba qadam and my whole nazar, my thought, my heart should be following that reality. What did they do? I should be doing it. Not how they are now, what did they do in all their training? I should be reading from them, I should be understanding and, and, and taking in their videos, all of these teachings and practices so that I can reach to that reality of a muqaddam. And then I know that my heart is on that with them. It's not just you look down, somebody walking by and look down, oh somebody walk by you look down. This is a whole entire way of life that every moment we have to ask, Ya Rabbi is my nazar, is my, my true vision of my heart and is my heart really with them and my heart is on that path? Or I'm kind of here, I'm kind of there. So there's a deeper, much deeper understanding that every day we were fighting ourselves and struggling with ourselves that I can't do it, it's too difficult, I can't do it but I gave so much into it there was no way but doing it. There was nowhere to go but doing it. And you know who I saw a movie and I found that the military copies us. Remember modern military you had a shovel and you had a pick pitchfork. Western militaries they would go round up all the farmers say, come on we're going to go fight this town and they come with pitchforks and things. The concept of, of discipline and organization were tariqahs. And so I saw one of these movies on the, the seals and how they train the seals. They break them to quit, they keep pushing them so they quit. They put them all the way under water until they can't breathe and they go into a state of death, they bring them back up, resuscitate them until the person says, this is crazy and I'm not going to do this and I'm leaving. And they, they won't out of a hundred people, they want 30 of them and 70 of them will be quitting. Where they understood that reality? That to, to test, to test, to test so that there is no quitting, there is no sort of going sidelines that all our life was about the testing. As a result of testing as difficulty you keep testing, you keep testing and you're looking at your heart, Ya Rabbi is my nazar, is my focus, not my physical eyes but my spiritual eye, is it on my path? Uh, every decision I'm making is that, is that my, my… according to my path and what's necessary for my path? And then if my heart is following my path, of course my eyes will be following the path. The more difficult is the heart of insan, not physical eye, physical eye they just lower their gaze and, and pretending to, to be lowering their gaze. That's great but the real nazar is the gaze of the heart, that is your heart on your path and are you constantly struggling to keep your path, making it more difficult for yourself, more complex for yourself. More time spent on your awrad, more time spent on all of the disciplines, more time spent on the association, more time spent on watching. There's so much happening, so much to be digesting, that's the struggle. When you say, ah, I can't do it, I just, uh, uh, but I'm so much into it there's no way I can quit. And that's what your nafs is saying to you, quit, quit, quit. And those whom are successful in the way of Allah they never quit inshaAllah, to ask Allah to take them off this earth before that event should happen. That Allah to give them strength and himmah into reaching towards these Divine Oceans of Reality. Then and begin now the spiritual understanding for the third principle is safar dar watan. Latan, Watan depending upon the except V or Wa. <laughs> so Safar Dar Watan is the journey inward. Means the traveler back to your homeland, the seeker is to return back to the Creator. To know that we are from paradise and that we are asking to return to that reality, love for one's homeland is a sign of faith, not only physical homeland but it's more important is the spiritual homeland. That we are people from paradise oceans, heavenly oceans 
and that my safar dar watan is all about tafakkur. So imagine now these three principles of Naqshbandiya which is the foundation of anyone thinking they're Naqshbandi, then how come these are not being taught? And people thinking that, oh these guys who are talking about meditation, these are you know doing something different. It's actually this is Naqshbandiya, other things we don't know what the people are focusing on or not focusing on anything. Safar dar watan then now means my whole journey is inward. I should be busy inward. I don't have to worry about outside people, I only have to worry about the demon inside of me. I don't have to fix outside people, I don't have to do dawah to outside people, I just have to fix myself. So then I begin to take my journey inside. And then that begins the whole process of Naqshbandiya is then to look at myself, look at my character, look at my deeds, taking my meditation every night and taking a, a nighttime hisab that I take an accounting of myself that Ya Rabbi what are the people, places and things that I like or dislike and if I dislike them why based on myself not based on anything else. So that I take an inventory of myself, why I dislike this person, why I dislike that person and not because you find something wrong with them because this is only for your grave but what is your sickness in everything in your journey inward? What is your sickness? Why is it that you have jealousy? Why is it that you have envy? Why, why all of these issues so that I get to know myself and I get to know what my triggers what are my sicknesses, what are my difficulties and that's why we said then the greater hajj is the inner hajj in which the servant starts in Muharram and begin to go inside, go inside, what is wrong with me, Why am, what is the anger in me, what is the character in me, what are the dirtinesses around me so that I can cleanse my heart because later on the, the higher levels of the principles will be vigilance of the heart, how to be vigilant of the heart, how to safeguard the heart from agitation, aggravation and anger. That when you get angry this is not about one person and another person I'm going to set them straight. It means you lost your path. Allah doesn't care about any arguments, Allah doesn't care about any relations. Because these relations are all dunya. If Allah testing the servant, all he cares about is your grave and that you're not going to ever reach your reality before you enter into that grave. So that it's not about any issues, it's about what's happening to my heart now. That the conversation is agitating my heart, best to hang up and break away, take some air and be vigilant over your heart. Anything that's agitating you and aggravating you in a discussion, wuqf qalb and to be vigilant into the heart, to, to guard and safeguard the heart and all of its, its immense powers, what are the bad, what is the good, what are the emotions. So it means now the safar dar watan is then the journey is a inward journey and when we go inward we're going from the, the lowest levels up into the heavens and then from the heavens all the way coming down towards the worst desires and the bad desires within insan. It's the immense ocean that no matter how much time they give us you can go deeper and deeper. And what separates us from just people who are superficially trying to act out the hadith and the way of Sayyidina Muhammad is that awliyaullah come and teach us the depth of it that you know the closing of one eyes, lowering of one eyes and, 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 and sort of superficial things that people may be doing for other people. But the nazar, its immensity is actually the nazar of the heart and the nazar of the heart is the more powerful. 
Remember in our principles the inside controls the outside, that your physical faculties are of no value if the inside of you doesn't control them. So that when you're meditating and contemplating the nazar of the heart is on the qadam. So it means that my heart has to be continuously vigilant of my path and that to keep my path, to keep my way, to, to sacrifice so that I'm on my path and everything is about the path. And so it's less important that the eyes and most important that the heart and that which the heart focuses on will pull you towards it. So that's why the dunya people wrote a book called The Secret. They took from the hadith and made millions of dollars, right? They said, what you focus on you can draw it to you. So, I want a parking space, I want a parking space, oh lo and behold parking space has appeared. And they went and made millions telling people, follow your desires, focus on it, want it and it comes to you. But these haqqaiqs were not for dunya, these were the haqqaiqs for akhirah. So, awliya come and teach us that what you desire you're going to draw it towards you and if it's satanic of course shaitan going to throw it right into your face to distract you. So then the whole reality is based on that what I desire has to be my path and my path is symbolized by my feet and, and the reality of what qaddam is stands for. How to reach to these oceans of power that is only through the way of Muhammadun Rasulullah So that every day we ask ourselves, or, am I walking the path of Sayyidina Muhammad cheating, stealing, lying, or what path am I walking on? So that people don't get confused, oh I don't want to follow the tariqah, my, my husband doesn't like tariqah, my wife doesn't like tariqah, forget these words. This is about following the way of Sayyidina Muhammad and my life is, am I following the way of Prophet with good character, good akhlaq, the best of muhabbat and love, that's all that's important. And my heart has to continuously be vigilant in life that I am following that way. And then all the other realities, then we said the journey inward. Dar vatan, safar dar vatan or watan, watan is your body and the safar and the traveling inside means that as 99% of the world is traveling outside, focused on which country they belong to, go out into the streets and throw rocks on it. Uh, even the Dalai Lama who's not supposed to be associated with anything wants his country. Everybody focusing on the outside and awliyaullah are coming, Mawlana Shah Naqshaban coming and teaching us, you journey inward to the home, the home that's most important for you, your station in Allah's Divinely Presence. And that your focus in life is your journey inward into the Divinely Presence. That's why we said that the first step of journeying is not that am I submitting to Rabbi al-A'la but I'm submitting to all the satanic rabs that are governing me. So the Lord, the, the, in these teachings that word rab and lordship and that which governs you is a lord over you. So then people who think they are following Rabbi al-A'la it's, it's insulting to Allah to make it sound so easy when in reality it's shaitan that people are following. If they smoke, they drink, they have these different character vices, those are shaitans that are lords over those people and people and ourselves because we can't get rid of them. 
if we were truly following and submitting to Rabbi Al-A'la, the Lord Most High, then it would have been a different existence. But because of the lordship of this lower dimension and the, how they have grabbed people, then they find themselves submitting to that reality. So Safad al Watan is then to first find those that my journey is inward. I have to reach this Mecca. If you can't get your $30,000 ticket for that one, this one is free. The heart Mecca is free, Baytullah, Qalb al-Mu'min Baytullah. This one Allah says free, come inside, clean it, wash it, purify it and begin now your life of circumambulating and making tawaf around that reality. That safar dar watan then is opening all of that reality and my whole journey is about my inner battle, my inner character, my inner problems and resolves many of the conflicts. Why I have to worry about this person, that person, answer to about this thing or that thing. My life is about my grave and reaching that reality. I have to worry about myself before I can worry of others. I have to fix myself before I can fix others. A lot of emails about people trying to fix their children. I presume that after many years of not doing anything, some people wake up and realize their children who used to be nice cute little cubs have turned into wolves like werewolves. We said before every bachigorg, every child like a bachigorg is like a, a cute little cub but every gorg become like a wolf, some become like werewolf. Because when they're too wild impossible to control and then that was a symbol of that path that I have to fix myself. And for those whom are young and about to establish their families or young and have young children, you shouldn't be emailing only about the child but you should be fixing yourself. Not do as I say to my children but do as I do. So I busy myself, clean myself, perfect myself, stop my yelling, stop my screaming, stop all my craziness so that as I'm doing my children will do. And they learn by copying you, not by what you say but what you do. And then alhamdulillah by the grace of Allah then you're raising them in the way of the love of Sayyidina Muhammad And if they're older now and you're emailing and it's too late, it's never too late to fix yourself. That once you begin to fix yourself, don't need to keep emailing that these 10 kids are not listening to me. There's no kid that listens to anyone. All you have to worry about is that, how come you're not listening to Allah? We can see how that's like a, a, a what do they call oxymoron? When you're asking, <laughs> you keep asking, how come the kid's not listening to me? Shaykh give me wazifa so my kids will listen to me. And it's like Allah sending an email that, how come they're not listening to me? So that's why then I busy myself with myself, it's never too late. Fix myself, fix my characteristics, fix my love for Sayyidina Muhammad as I draw near to that reality, to that perfection, to that light and to that blessing. Allah resolve everything on the outside. As I fix myself and draw to that reality, Allah fixes everything on the outside. Otherwise one whom busies themselves on the outside they forgot about everything inside. And then you're fixing just you know things by your physical force. But what we need is for Allah to resolve these issues. And that can only be resolved when we are running towards Allah when we're running towards the love of Sayyidina Muhammad where Allah loves the servant and the rest is testing. Allah tests and He loves them for the sake of the love He has for that servant. So if you're good with Allah 
then you know that it's all in Allah's hands and life is filled with testing. So this is all part of Safar Dar Watan and Safar Dar Watan opens up Khalwat Dar Anjuman. So the fourth principle of Naqshbandiya is the Khalwa Dar Anjuman. Is a seclusion amongst the Anjuman, the people and the crowds. So there are those whom they seclude themselves away from the crowd and they run away and they have nothing to offer to the people. But Naqshbandiya Mawlana Shah Naqshban wanted for his students that the higher reality is to be with your Lord receiving these fires and at the same time to be amongst the people so they benefit from that reality. Then Allah sends you far more for the benefit of the people that are surrounding you knowing and unknowing of your connection. So then if that is the higher goal then now all of this its foundation is tafakkur. How to connect, how to connect your heart, how to go deep into your meditation so that your seclusion is always in the crowd. How to be with your Lord, how to be in your connection, how to keep the vigilance on your heart and your character but yet being amongst people so that you don't lose yourself as soon as you enter into the crowds of people. That becomes then the foundation of the levels that will be going up. So we're not a people that run off into the woods and hide from everyone. We're people whom we struggled hard, made our connection and as a result of making that connection then you're amongst people. And as a result humanity benefits from the presence of that servant. Just their connection, their zikr, their salawats, their fatiha, their movement is a light that shines out and that that creation and creatures are benefiting from that presence. For what is the benefit for Allah to bless a servant and then the servant hides? And uh, who benefits now? And those are particular ones if Allah wants them to be hidden then they're hidden. But Khalwat Dar Anjuman is that I be amongst the people and I'm always in the presence of the ones whom I love and I keep their inner association in the inner lights of these realities. InshaAllah we try to go through more at a later time but at least the, the these four steps, are we at the fourth now? Yeah, the fourth steps and fourth principles of Naqshbandiya inshaAllah. Subhana rabbika rabbal izzat amin yasifoon, salaam ala mursaleen, walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa hurmati Muhammad al-Mustafa wa basir Surat al-Fatiha. InshaAllah these are all for the realities of Hajj and the inner reality of Hajj. That we're always in a movement towards the Divinely Presence and so that Allah to make our hajj and the hijrah to be real, to be blessed with the immensity of Allah's Divinely blessings inshaAllah.